Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Um, welcome to your first set of screencast and notes in AP Biology. Um, all we're going to do today is just review the intro to evolution notes. We already took these notes back about three weeks ago. I just want to review with you because it's been a while. Um, and in this particular set of notes, there are there is a guaranteed FRQ that I will ask you probably on Friday. Um, so it's really important that you understand these notes. Um, it's part of your term grade. Um, I will tell you that I'm being accompanied by my dog, and she is doing nonstop licking of gross areas of her body. Um, and then she'll undoubtedly start barking, and then my family will come in and yell at me. And so chaos might happen, but we're going to have fun with this. Um, the other thing that I will mention is that I screencast for honors bio all the time, and I'm able to get my face um, on the PowerPoints that we do. But for some reason, when I go full screen with the Prezi, um, the image here disappears. So I, I kind of think that this mug is funny and that you kind of like to look at the mug, um, but it won't be there when we do these notes. So my apologies on that. It, technically, it's still there. You just won't get to see it. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I strongly recommend that you take some notes, not tons of notes, but there's a few notes on how natural selection works that I think are really key to you doing well on the FRQ I'm going to ask you later this week. All right, so here we go. Um, this is, again, an introduction to evolution, so just sort of the background information. Um, I mentioned this earlier. I don't like the author of this Prezi. I think he made some inappropriate slides and comments, and I, I don't like them. So if you see me zip by something really quickly, it's just because I think it's unnecessary. Um, but I will slow down and focus in on the things that I think are important. So that would be an example right there of one of those that's just not necessary. Okay, so really quickly, where does Darwin come from in terms of history? You need to understand that he is not coming up with his ideas totally in a vacuum. There's all kinds of important science that's happening in the 19th century, and it's building to help um, Darwin come up with his final ideas. So we start coming up with ideas about um, the... Um, laws of superposition. Sorry, um, I'm having a brain fart there for a second. Um, the laws of superposition basically say, scientists are coming up with this in the 19th century, that the oldest sediment is found on the bottom and the more recent sediment is found on top. So we have younger fossils that are found at the top and older fossils that are found on the bottom. And we're starting to realize now that some of those strata are actually really, really old. Malthus, um, Thomas Malthus, is also taking a look at um, population dynamics, and he's um, getting coming up with the idea that populations are going to continue to increase and increase and increase until they start running out of resources. And that's super important to Darwin's um, idea of natural selection. So he's going to pull from Malthus. He's going to pull from all these other scientists. So... Um, Okay, moving on. Sorry, we didn't need that. Um, Lyell is the one that talks about uniformitarianism and the idea that um, processes that are happening on Earth today, things that we can see happening today, well, they've probably been happening all along. Um, and so he's got this idea of how geology, how the planet is changing. And his idea is that the planet is, in fact, extremely old, older than anything scientists up to that point had thought of. And again, this works into um, Darwin's theories. Lamarck is actually one of the first ones to come up with a theory of evolution. Um, but he makes this royal mistake. Um, he believes life evolves, bingo. Um, but then he believes that organisms can inherit acquired characteristics. Um, so basically that means that if um, somebody weightlifts, that their baby will be born with bigger muscles. Um, and obviously we all know that that's not correct, um, but they didn't understand the principles of genetics at that time. And so um, Lamarck didn't really understand what was wrong with his theory. Darwin is the one that comes up with a better use um, of evolution and understanding these characteristics a little bit better. Okay, so this was the stew that Darwin worked in. So quick biography, you don't need to know much about Darwin. Um, he, as a young man, super, super smart, but couldn't decide what career, even considered going into the um, into religion, into um, a monastery, um, but ends up working on the HMS Beagle as a ship's naturalist. He travels all around the world. 
Um, and he's studying um, life all over the planet. It's his job to record the life that they find. Um, and he starts coming up with some ideas about how life is changing all over the planet. And I'm not going to go into the details on this. And this is all about the organisms that are found on the Galapagos Islands, which are an area that he landed. Um, and the life on these islands are very, very um, interesting because they're unique to each island. And they're similar to the lives um, to the life forms that are on the mainland, but they have slight variations. And so this is what gets Darwin starting to think. Now, ironically, when he gets home from his five year trip, he doesn't publish right away. He does all kinds of things. He avoids um, publishing his ideas. Um, in fact, he avoids publishing his ideas for about 20 years. His ideas are incredibly controversial until um, he's contacted by Alfred Russell Wallace, who is coming up with almost the identical ideas. And so Darwin eventually publishes his book that you can still find today called the Origin of Species on the Origin of Species. Um, and this is where Darwin really puts forward how evolution is happening. And this is where he sets himself apart from Lamarck, who thought acquired characteristics could be um, inherited. So let's talk about what natural selection actually says and what is really part of um, Darwin's genius. So this is how it works. And this, if you're going to write anything down today, you need to write down these five steps and some details about these five steps. So um, very roughly, this is how Darwin is saying things happen. First of all, he says there's overproduction of offspring. All organisms are having too many babies, um, whether that's um, too many little um, seeds from the dandelion or um, spores from this fungus, whether it's cottonwood seeds when the cottonwoods are shedding um, their um, cotton, their seeds in the springtime, or whether it's um, baby Nemo's from the movie Nemo, um, Finding Nemo, whatever. They're having too many babies and many of them don't survive. In step number two, now I would add a lot to this Prezi right here if I could. Step number two is the idea that all of these babies that are being born, like in the photo, um, are varied. And Darwin has no understanding of genetics, but this is key. He understands that the babies are born with these characteristics. These are not characteristics that they acquire during their lifetimes, but they're born. Now that we know stuff about genetics and DNA, we can say this is why they're born with these things because it's a gene that they inherited from their parents. Darwin knows he gets it; for, they get it from their parents, but he doesn't know anything about DNA. Now, what I would like to add to this section, um, it says, yes, there's variation among the individuals, but Darwin's um, sort of focused in on good variations and he called those good variations adaptations. Now, be careful with the word adaptation because it sounds like um, I adapted well to my difficult circumstances. If you use the word adapt in that um, context, it implies you changed during your lifetime. And that's not how Darwin is using the word adaptation. Darwin is talking about a helpful trait, a useful trait that an organism is born with. He refers to that as an adaptation. So some organisms are born with things that are bad for them. They're born with a bad immune system or a weak heart or um, coloration that makes them super obvious to predators. But on an extremely rare occasion, there is a mutation. Now we know it's mutation. He didn't know that at, at the time. There's a very rare occasion where there's a mutation that gives an organism an advantageous trait. And that advantageous trait is called by Darwin an adaptation. All right, so then in part number three, sec or step number three, Darwin says there's competition for limited resources. All these babies that are being born, um, they have to compete. They have to compete for mates. They have to compete for food. They have to compete to escape from predators. They have to survive diseases. All these things that they are competing. And so a limited number of them are going to survive. And then very importantly, in step number four, the successful competitors... They are the ones that survive all these challenges. That means that they get to reproduce and they pass on those successful traits. Um, Darwin referred to step number four as differential reproduction. Now, if the word differential intimidates you, then cross off the I-A-L at the end and just learn it as different reproduction. 
organisms reproduce at a different rate. And Darwin's hypothesis at this point is that organisms with adaptations, useful variations, are going to reproduce at a higher rate. And organisms that don't have those reprodu or don't have those adaptations are going to reproduce at a lower rate. Then have this whole process, these four steps, repeat over and over and over and over again over millions of years, and we see life changing and life evolving on this planet. All right, so that's the foundation of how natural selection and evolution happens. Um, now the author of this presentation goes on to give you some examples. And what I don't like is that the author starts with artificial selection, which ironically I, I would have put later in the presentation because artificial selection happens because humans got involved. And we're not talking about how it would have happened naturally, which that would be my choice for doing as the first example. But anyway, we're going to talk about artificial selection. So anytime something's artificial, it means that humans are involved. So in this case, there's two great examples. There's the example of dogs, where dogs come from, and there's an example of a crop. Um, all crops that we can think of, whether it's wheat or corn or whatever crop you can think of, humans have been involved in artificially selecting it. So in artificial selection, um, fitness, those advantageous traits, are not necessarily the traits that Darwin was talking about that allow them to compete better and to survive better in the wild. In artificial selection, those advantageous traits are defined as the traits that humans liked or wanted. And so humans selected for those traits. So if they saw a corn plant that had more kernels on the ear than another one did, they would take that corn plant seeds and plant those and increase the crop and increase the number of kernels that were on a given ear of corn. If you look at the dogs, being a wiener dog is not an advantageous trait in nature. However, that is an advantageous trait when we're talking about artificial selection because lots of humans think that wiener dogs are cute. So we purposely choose those particular traits. So I don't like starting with artificial selection because it's kind of not natural selection, um, but we'll move on. All right, so some other examples. Um, Darwin's finches are sort of a classic example. They are in almost every ACT exam I've ever seen. They would undoubtedly be on your AP exam if you were being tested on natural, on, yeah, natural selection and evolution. But basically with Darwin's finches, what he noticed is that these finches that were all over the Galapagos Islands had different sized beaks. They were clearly related individuals, but their beak sizes were all different. And so the idea here is that the beak sizes varied based on the food sizes that were available. So some of the um, islands had fruit, some of the islands had seeds, some of the islands had insects. And um, being born with a different sized beak was either an advantage or a disadvantage, depending on what food was available on that particular island. And so individuals um, either were more successful or less successful, depending on the size of their beaks. Over time, over millions of years, their beak size changed significantly so that you can identify different types of finches. All right, now modern day, this is so important because we're seeing this right here, right now with the pandemic, um, pesticide resistance and antibiotic resistance. These are examples where we can see evolution happening, not on a million year scale, but on an hourly basis. Um, with uh, hourly is maybe a little bit of an exaggeration, but with pesticide um, resistance, we have a crop, let's say a farm, and there's insects that are eating the crop. So the farmer sprays a pesticide on the farm to kill the, to kill the bugs that are eating his or her crop. Well, that pesticide will kill the weak individuals, the individuals that do not have a resistance to the pesticide. The only individuals that are gonna survive in that farmer's um, farm are the ones that have a resistance. So now we basically got rid of competition for those individuals. And now the only ones that are gonna be surviving and reproducing are the strong resistant type. So now if that farmer keeps using that pesticide year after year, they're gonna be getting rid of the weak bugs and actually producing a stronger breed of bug that's resistant to their pesticide. And we see that happening all over the world all the time. We have to keep rotating pesticides or getting stronger pesticides because the organisms keep 
um, adapting. Those are the reason that they're resistant is it's a mutation. Um, Darwin didn't understand it was a mutation, but we know that now. The same thing happens with antibiotics and antiviral medications. Antibiotics are for bacteria, antivirals are for, are for viruses. So if we have um, a large group of bacteria and we, um, we treat it with an antibiotic, the only survivors are going to be the antibiotic resistant ones. And now we've killed everybody else. So there's all this space for the resistant ones to start growing. So now we're going to grow this big batch of antibiotic resistant bacteria. And actually the same thing can happen with viruses. So oftentimes the best um, way to protect ourselves from a virus is with a vaccine. Unfortunately, with the pandemic, the coronavirus vaccine is still a long ways out. Um, so we're trying maybe some use with antiviral medications, but um, a vaccine would really be the ideal. All right. Um, other things, I, you know, I don't know that we need to go over this too much more because I want to wrap it up. Um, but we can see the effect of food type on the length of, be uh, of the beak of the soapberry bug. You can take a look at these diagrams and watch what happens over time. And I think that's about it. Um, in your PBS evolution um, lab, you should be building these different um, trees that we're going to be taking a look at. So that'll be part of your assignment for tonight. Ooh, I hope that wasn't too long. You guys have a great day. We'll talk to you soon.